All right, folks, welcome to Investing for Beginners podcast. Today we have episode 365. Today we're going to talk about financial metrics that matter. So without any further ado, let's just dive in and start digging in. So the first one we have is market cap. So what is market cap and how does that impact investments? Yeah, let's start from the easiest and work our way down until we're talking about discount rates, huh? Yes. <laughs> discount rates. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Market cap. So market cap's a good way to get an idea of the size of a business. It's not always the best, but it's it's a decent proxy. So it's telling you how much the stock is valued in the market. The higher, the bigger. Some general ranges, guidelines. I don't know if this is still applicable, but I think it is. Like anything over two billion is considered small cap. Mm-hmm. So anything under two billion is is micro cap land. Yeah, and then you start getting a large cap land at ten billion or higher, and then you have the mega caps at 100, 200 billion. So those would be. Well, those used to be the Googles and Facebooks. Right. Yeah. Now, now, they're, now trillions. they're trillions. <laughs> right. So. You know, sometimes it can be helpful in that a very high market cap company might not have that much growth left in it, but our favorite phrase, it depends. Hmm. What are your thoughts on micro cap, market cap, (laughs) market cap? I think it's helpful to realize maybe what kind of scale they're playing at and Hmm. what kind of game they're playing versus others. Sometimes we hear the market you, you hear companies bandied around in the market and you think, oh my gosh, that must be a really big company. And then you find out it's like 4 billion market cap or some crazy number. Or reverse, this company is 120 billion in market cap? I had no idea. I never heard of it. To me, it's more a case of what kind of game are they playing? What is the business doing? And kind of how is the market reacting or treating this company? Some companies can have really, really big market caps when they really don't deserve it. Rivian, that can be another one. Uh, I just read today that uh, OpenAI is being valued at $157 billion right now, and it's doing 4 or $5 billion in revenue, which sounds like a lot, but when you compare that to Amazon, that's peanuts. So it's just kind of yeah. interesting. Yeah, I think there's a pretty big misconception in that i mean to say this because you just mentioned revenue obviously with open ai there's no profits to speak of no. it is interesting to me that because stock prices follow earnings market caps follow the level of profitability for mm-hmm. a stock and so to your point like one of them that really surprised me is mckesson or cvs is another decent example i think mckesson's even better like 500 billion in sales or something crazy but then the market cap's only like a 50 billion Mm -hmm. or 100 billion or something so it's like because the profit margins are so small even costco super Mm -hmm. super small market cap compared to like everyone kind of knows what it is and their scale is so huge but the amount of profits they actually make is small today because their profit margins are so thin Mm -hmm. so that market cap is smaller than i think you might think right if that makes sense yeah totally does it's an interesting metric and it's good to know but i don't know that it helps you a whole lot in your analysis of a company yeah you would you agree disagree yeah Good thing I put it first, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Something really useful. <laughs> right. It, to me, it's like I liken it to a book cover or a magazine cover. It's mm. interesting yeah. and it can make it appealing for you to look deeper into, but it doesn't really help you or tell you much about the book you're reading or the magazine you're reading. Yeah. That's good. That's a good one. I like that one. Mm. All right. So let's move on to dividend yield. This obviously is right in your wheelhouse. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if I buy a stock, I want to know generally what what am I getting out of it. And so there's been times in my investing journey where I've forgotten this a little bit. And um, sometimes I have to remind myself, like as an example, I have a REIT that's in my account right now in my portfolio, Real Estate Investment Trust. 
And sometimes when I look at the growth and I compare it to like Microsoft or something, I'm like, why don't I just sell this thing and buy more Microsoft? That's a different story. But I sometimes forget that I also have a 5% yield on it. And so even if the stock price only gains, let's say 6%, as an investor, I got a total return of 11%. And so that's that's something that I think beginners focus on it too much because it's it's seductive in that you know you're going to get that as a return. I know I'm going to get 3% of my money if I buy this 3% dividend company. So that's very attractive if you're new. But then if as you get down further down the journey, I sometimes forget that like, well, yeah, I'm getting a pretty nice dividend from this. Mm-hmm. I should factor that in when I compare it and don't feel bad if if the price is underperforming, but if my total return is actually higher, then that's great. We should be happy when a company, you know, is growing and has a high dividend yield. Mm-hmm. I know that's counterintuitive because it could also be a warning signal, but it can also be a good thing too. Yeah, it could be a great thing. And you're exactly right. You think about you think about some of the dividend aristocrats or dividend kings. These are companies of a certain size that have paid dividends over 25 to 50 years. And I think a big a large attraction to a company like, let's say Johnson and Johnson, is the fact that they pay a two and a half, three and a half, four percent dividend yield and they grow four or five percent a year. And that's especially in the day of low interest rates bond yields were not great and so if you are if you are an investor that was closer to retirement something like johnson and johnson would be very appealing because it's a very stable company pays a really good dividend gets some decent growth and you can get a better return owning something like that than you could a bond which is safer ideally than a stock but that's that's how a lot of these dividend companies get used and to andrew's point a lot of people forget that that yield is part of the return that you can get we get we get transfixed by the you know 25 percent returns that you get from a company like microsoft but that's you know unfortunately that doesn't most of the time i'll ca- put the caveat that doesn't last forever and so then something like dividend yield can be an integral part of your returns. But like Andrew said, there is a dark side to the dividend yield. And when they get too high, 10, 12, 15, 20%, those are A, unsustainable, and B, that's usually a sign that the company is going through some not great times. If it looks too good to be true? Usually is. <laughs> Especially in the stock market. All right. Let's move on to the P.E. ratio. Yeah, this is probably, I mean, they all matter, but this is a really nice one. It's a great shortcut for telling you how cheap or expensive a stock is. Comes with all the usual caveats like a lot of different metrics do. There's always exceptions to the rule. But P.E. is nice because I can look at alphabet or Starbucks, and I can look at their P.E. ratio and I can compare it to what's the S&P's P.E. ratio. And that way, if I'm talking to another investor like Dave, we can use the P.E. ratio to communicate a a relative level of cheapness or expensiveness without having to both pull out our Excel spreadsheets and look at them side by side just to talk about how cheap or expensive a stock is. Mm -hmm. And so that's a great way if you're a beginner to start to learn about why stocks are expensive or why they are cheap, PE ratio is a great way to do that. And it's also helpful down the line. It saves you time and and kind of bucket stocks into different PE ratios. And that can help you understand how the market is viewing a company. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Before I dive in, I wanted to apologize. Uh, There's some wildlife right out my window that (laughs) seems to be having a conversation with another, i.e. bird. And so if you hear that in the background, I apologize. Not much I can do about it at the moment. So they're having a argument, I think. (laughs) The the PE ratio can be super, super helpful when you're trying to, especially when you're newer to investing, it can be a great shortcut to tell you you know what the company could or could not be worth it's not the end-all be-all 
but especially when we're trying to talk to each other or compare other companies in the same industry, that's a very key point in the same industry. You can't compare the PE ratio of Microsoft to Bank of America because Bank of America will never win. Or if they do, then that's probably another conversation. But it has a dark side too to it. It can be overused and people can ignore it at their own peril. There's different industries where the PE ratio can be very helpful when you're looking at a company. But if you don't use it in the right way and if you don't compare it to others in the same industry or as Andrew was talking about earlier today, if you don't compare it to the S&P 500, for example, then you could put yourself in a, in a bad place. And so you just have to kind of realize that you know, there's always going to be some caveats when you're looking at any of these ratios or metrics and just kind of understand what it is that it's good for and just kind of make sure that you temper any sort of enthusiasm, especially if you see a company like, oh my gosh, it's only at a 7 PE. That's awesome. Sometimes there's a reason that it's at a 7 PE and we have to understand that. So uh, never ever buy a company because it's super cheap, just because, and never ever buy a company because it's super expensive, just because. So it, it needs to be a little bit deeper thought than, hey, it's at a 7 PE. Well, why? Oh, <laughs> if those are the responses, then we need to, we need to dig deeper. All right, let's move on to the next one. So average 10-year revenue growth. This is a great one. We don't think we've ever talked about this before. So lay your thoughts out on this one. Just the idea, basically. I, I want a company that's growing because lots of good things happen when a company grows. And so you can look. And investing is the same way. It's, it's funny. You can say any story you want. Just pick the starting point and the end point. And you can tell any story about a stock. You can also do the same with a company and their growth. And so I like to look at 10 years and look at the year over year change over 10 years and then try to average that out to account for big swings like we saw 2020, 2021. And the idea being if you find enough businesses that are doing that over 10 years, you probably will have a portfolio with businesses that can also grow in, into the future that's the hope that's the goal and you know these are all past looking metrics so there's all caveats with that as well but mm -hmm. by looking at a long time horizon you're more likely to find those companies that can continue to succeed yep exactly the beauty of looking at a 10-year period is it can give you a view of how strong the company's product or services with the customers because if you see a growing 10-year average revenue growth that indicates that they're doing something right and if they're doing it over a longer period of time chances are they're going to continue doing it going forward as well if you look at a one or two or three year period it can be insightful but it also can illustrate an unusual bump or something unreasonable happened once and it won't happen again we look at Zoom is, a, I think, a really good example of that, where they saw a huge revenue growth spike. And then since then, it's kind of struggled. The stock price has struggled too, but it's also the company itself has struggled to maintain that same level of revenue growth. And so it's really hard to, when you look at shorter periods, you can be fooled a little bit. And so I think looking at a 10-year period can really help smooth out the bumps. The, the other thing I like to do with this is look at a 10, a five and a three year period and just like kind of rolling periods to see how it's done because there was that whole pandemic thing, the pesky pandemic thing in the middle there, it really can kind of skew sometimes the numbers. And so if the company has gone through some sort of change or if they've you know, maybe have new management or they've rolled out a new product that's even more popular than what they were doing before, Th that could also skew the numbers. And maybe they had really high revenue growth before the pandemic and it's kind of cooled since, but you still look at the revenue growth as, as pretty decent. That can also give you an indication of, okay, maybe something else has changed here. So that's, that's kind of how I try to use it. So why revenue, not profits? I will do the same with profits, but revenue growth is the, it's the driver of all of it. You can only 
revenue growth can fix a lot of problems and you can only cut costs so much. And to a certain point, you, you know, you got to have at least somebody to turn the lights on and run the place and it can only benefit you so far. So revenue growth can cover a lot of warts, I guess is the best way of putting it. Yep, for sure. All right. So what are your thoughts on consecutive years of dividend raises? Yeah, I think this is an interesting metric because it can make you wonder or think. It's like if a business has a great 10-year track record, but they're, they've only paid a, a rising dividend for two years, then that begs the question, why? So if they just started a dividend program, then cool. You know, that makes sense. But do they have a history of being erratic with their dividend or, you know, is it indicating that there's a, is management communicating that there's there's issues down the road? So just one of those kind of like peak over the hill kind of metrics, like maybe this can be something deeper. But I just like to know the context and give kudos to the companies I can do it for 10 years because that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. It is. You have to keep in mind that it, a dividend, paying a dividend is a capital allocation decision and they have to have profits to do that. And yeah. so if the company is not growing its profits, it's going to find it harder and harder to continue to issue a dividend. And so to Andrew's point, it's, it's a great way to kind of look over the hill and see what's coming and what has, what they've been able to do. And if you see things on the horizon that may not, that may preclude this from happening in the future, that could be a sign that maybe it's time to get out of the company too. So that mm -hmm. very helpful. All right. Let's move on to five-year average ROIC, our favorite metric. Yeah. So the reason why this metric is important, I would point people to our episode we did with Brian Feraldi recently, where he talked about Warren Buffett's thoughts on net income. Yeah. And um pretty in-depth covered return on capital and why that's important. Mm -hmm. So I try to look for companies that have an ROIC at least of like 10. I mean, I would struggle anything less than that unless they have contracted revenues for the next 100 years. But even then, sometimes it's iffy. Or maybe if I was playing the growth game where I was looking for growth companies, which I don't do, but if I was looking for growth companies, I would... That would be like, okay, I'm fine with low ROIC because I know they're reinvesting in the business kind of a thing. But for the game I play and the type of stocks I look for, I want to have an ROIC of at least 10. And you look over five years for all the same reasons you look over 10 years for revenue growth. Mm -hmm. So 15 is pretty good. I'm usually happy with 15. 20 is like, okay, this is a really good, really good one. And then 30 and 40 is just kind of icing on the cake. Those mm -hmm. are all nice. 50 uh, if you take out excess cash, Google's at 50, Apple's at like 150. So, you know, everybody kind of knows those are all great businesses. But I think what's important to understand something I didn't know super well when I first started getting the ROIC is uh, you don't get bonus points for being 50 instead of 40. Like either, ca like what we're trying to find out is a company capital efficient or not. Mm -hmm. And then how the future plays out is really going to depend on that business and all the factors around that business it's not oh well they got 40 last year so they're better than the 35 mm -hmm. that's not always the case there's too many other moving pieces right yeah very much so there's way too many moving pieces the thing i like about looking at roic in over the longer period too is it it tells you how well management has allocated capital over a longer period of time and that's very important because job number one for a CEO is to allocate capital. And the more efficiently they do that, and that's what ROIC is, is it's an efficiency ratio. It tells you how well they reinvest the money that they generate. And the better they do that, in theory, the better they will grow. And so when you see a longer period of high, of good ROIC, like Andrew said, 1015 is, is good. Anything above that is, you know, pretty awesome. And if you see that over a longer period of time, that means it, it could indicate that the company has some sort of level of a moat or it has some sort of competitive advantage that going to allow it to continue to be 
financially successful for more than just next year. And those are the kinds of companies that you want to, to look at. And the other thing that's also awesome about looking at a five-year period as opposed to a one-year period is there, there are a lot of things that can happen in one year that could cause a company to have this awesome ROIC. And then the 10 years before it was, you know, trash. And then the 10 years after it, it's trash. <laughs> and then you walk into a bad investment. So when you look at a, a longer period, whether it's, you know, a three, five or 10 year period, those can all give you indications that, Hey, this is a superior business. And this is something worth looking into and, and, and digging a little deeper. Yeah, totally. Speaking our love language. All right, so let's uh, let's talk valuation. So we got a couple of some valuation metrics. So the first one is free cash flow to equity per share. So what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so this just refers to the, you know, you want to try to value a company. The way to do it is you look at their cash flows. And there's two different ways you can do that. You can look at the cash flow statement or you can do mostly... Um, income balance sheet. I like to use a cash flow statement, so I use a free cash flow to equity. And what, really what we're trying to do is figure out what's the cash generating ability of this business. Try to project what that's going to look like for our portfolios over the next 10 years. And then you're just weighing the options between what are the other things we could invest in, what are the um, expected returns there. So for me, free cash flow equity, what I'm trying to do, I mean, if you look at a long enough time horizon, free cash flow and net income or earnings per share are pretty similar. I like to try to adjust for like Costco as an example, usually gets free cash flow as as a float. And so it makes it easier for them to grow. So I like to look for things like that. And sometimes that makes me more willing to pay for a stock that might have a higher PE because it generates more free cash flow as it grows. And so that's mm-hmm. That's one of the ways where something like looking at the free cash flow can help. Mm-hmm. Yep. I love free cash flow. I mean, it is the lifeblood of every company. And really, it comes down to that. If it can't generate it, the company won't be able to grow. Over a long period of time, this is one of the main ways that you can find growing profitable businesses that will continue to be successful over a longer period of time. No matter how awesome any business is, whether it's Apple, Microsoft, you know, Amazon, Google, whoever, NVIDIA, they all have to generate free cash flow and they all have to reinvest. And if they can't generate enough free cash flow to reinvest, then eventually the company will start to stagnate. And that's where this is so important when you're trying to value a company. And using free cash flow per share is basically the best way to value a company, especially if, as Brian said a few weeks ago, it's optimized for profits and it's growing. These are companies that will continue to generate free cash flow. And going back to the ROIC conversation, what that CEO does with the free cash flow that they generate is uber important to how well this company is con- going to continue to grow. You look at Jensen Wong and what he's been able to do at NVIDIA, they had the free cash flow for him to do the things that he was able to do. And he was able to invest in the GPU chips and the data centers and, and all those things. And now look at the whirlwind they're reaping from being able to do that. So none of that was possible without free cash flow. So uh, it's very, very important. The next one we have is, is free cash flow per share projected growth rate. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, kind of similar to the whole dividend yield situation. Something I wish I learned earlier and really internalized is this idea that, you know, let's say when we look at valuation, let's say you determine that a stock should be, it should be valued at like $110. It's currently like $99. So in theory, you buy the stock, you buy at 99 when the market realizes it should have been 110. Now you've just made $11 on your investment. So that's kind of where the margin of safety comes in. And that can be a great way to make money in the stock market. Mm -hmm. The other thing to consider, though, is that you also have the growth that the company has. And so it all depends on what that spread is and how much a company is growing. So as an example, if I were to find a, a stock that's like, let's say it's 110, that's what I think it's worth. That's what the market thinks it's worth. 
but let's say it grows at like 10% a year, that investment is going to outperform something. Maybe you bought it at 99, but it, but it's worth 110. But that only, let's say that one only grows at like 5%. Even though you're getting the gain from 99 to 110, you're still losing because 10% over 10 years is going to be 5% over 10 years plus what you're getting. It all depends on what the numbers ultimately are. And so if you make 50% on your money, that's going to do a lot more than uh, like a compounder would. Mm -hmm. Yes. But you also do have to respect that the compounders can also outperform a value opportunity. And so you have to weigh both sides to that. And that's why when I'm trying to figure out what growth rate do I think free cash flow is going to grow at? That's probably the thing I spend the most time on out of this entire list. Mm -hmm. It's because that's what your money is going to compound at after we, after all, after the market adjusts, either you were wrong or the market was wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a part of your return, but at the end of the day, it's going to be a big factor. So that's why the growth rate is so important. It's probably one of the more important parts of valuing the company is what kind of what kind of growth rate do you think the company is going to grow at because to your point you can buy something at a cheaper price but if it's not growing as fast over a longer period of time that's not going to matter and so that's why determining the growth rate is such a critical part of it and that kind of leads us to the discount rate so what are your thoughts on the discount rate yeah, not to get into the weeds, but discount rates kind of your opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I'm buying a stock and it only grew at 8%, I could have just bought the stock market at 10%. You want to try to account for that. And so that's what the discount rate does mm -hmm. to take a super complex. You could have five modules of, you know, graduate level courses on it, but that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to, you're trying to look at the cash flows. You're trying to project it into the future, project the growth, and you're discounting it to the past to basically say, okay, we want to at least earn a certain rate of return on this mm -hmm. to make up for the fact we could have just invested it in the stock in the uh, S and P 500. Right. Yep. Exactly. I think of it as a hurdle rate. If the discount rate is 10%, that's the minimum I need to earn to buy this company and feel like I made a good investment. You know, some people, you know, like Andrew said, there's a few ways you can go about attacking the discount rate. We're not going to go into them today, but you can go through a lot of math or you can just set a flat amount or you can use other rates, bond rates and things of that nature. It depends on what, how you think is the best way to do it. Andrew and I like some of the math part of it, well, a lot of the math part of it. That's what we think is the best way to do it. But just think of it as the hurdle rate or the rate you need to get to invest in this company. If I buy, if I buy Visa and I set the discount rate at 12%, I expect to get at least a 12% return from plunking my money down for Visa. And if I don't, then that's a disappointment. Yeah, and that changes depending on what company you're looking at. Yes. You could argue it should be all the same. I, I don't care what the investment is. Mm -hmm. I want a hurdle rate to be the hurdle rate, right? Right. But if you look at a group of stocks, you know, if I'm buying a group of really high risky stocks, I would demand a higher return from those yes. than something like a Visa. Yes. Because a couple of those might blow up in your face. Yes. So if you can account <laughs> for that in your valuation, then you're probably making better valuations. Right. Very, very, very good point. All right, let's move on to solvency. So we have interest coverage ratio. Yep. So I'm going to rapid fire on these. Each of the next three are just trying to look at, you know, is this company going to sustain itself moving forward? So interest coverage ratio, do they have enough income to service the interest on their, on their debt? Mm -hmm. So you literally just take operating income, you divide interest expense from the income statement. Both of those can be found in the income statement. And that ratio is interest coverage ratio. What's a good one in your opinion? I've read anything less than 1.5 run, run far, far away. Anything greater than 1.5, I prefer anything like above three. 
just to give myself a margin of safety. But yeah, this is one of those where the higher the number, the better. Yes. Net debt to EBITDA. Yeah. So here's one that helps you get the sense of how much debt a company has. And it, because it ties to EBITDA or it's that's like a profit metric, so it's tying it to the how much money the company can make. And that removes some of the limitations that debt to equity has, which is more asset based. So yeah, it's it's good to just kind of figure out, you know, I like to know if a if a company has a net to net debt to EBITDA of like five, might not be a hard pass, but it, it I should know that that's the case mm-hmm. and know that the debt's more important for a company like this than a company like Google, where it's like that's really zero because they have so much cash. Next one, current ratio. Yeah, this one current ratio looks at current assets divided by current liabilities and the higher the better but basically if they had to pay all their current assets i'm sorry if they had to pay all their current liabilities do they have the cash to do that so i make a couple of adjustments when i do one of these i include revolving lines of credit these are basically this is debt that they can tap to cover short term things so i include that and then if you want to be an overachiever like I am, you can exclude inventory. And that's what we call the quick ratio, mm. uh, what the industry calls it. But basically, it's trying to avoid situations like Circuit City, where if you looked at the current ratio, yeah, they had a lot of current liabil- current assets. Man, I'm screwing those up today. Uh, <laughs> you know, they had a lot of inventory, but you can't always assume that all inventory will be sold. Mm-hmm. So if, if you actually looked at Circuit City from a quick ratio basis instead of a current ratio basis, they really didn't have that much cash to cover what ended up putting them into bankruptcy. Mm-hmm. That's the big thing for that as you're trying to avoid super bad situations. Yeah. I liken the current ratio to I have this much cash and I have these many bills. Can I pay the bills with the cash I have on hand? Mm-hmm. To me, it's that simple. The last year of negative earnings last 20 years. Yeah, this is one of these like checks for me Mm. because I don't like to buy, and this is just personal preference, but I don't like to buy a company that's going to lose money for five or seven years in general. (laughs) We laugh about it, but there can be some value there, but Mm. that's just not the game I'm trying to play. So I would like to know. If you look like a company like Uber or something who was not profitable on purpose because they were growing, okay, that's one thing. But if part of their business is we're going to lose money for seven years and then mm. we're going to make make it all back in seven years, that's just really hard for me. And so that's why I use this metric, just to shine a light on situations where that might be the case. Right. There are some industries where there's, you know, there's the yin and yang of profitability and not profitability. You know, I'm thinking like commodities or maybe companies in the the biotech, you know, space that that's just part of their business model. They go through ins and outs of making a lot of money and periods where they don't make much, if at all, any money. And But to Andrew's point, that's just not a game I want to play and more power and more, you know, kudos to those who do. But that's just not a game I want to play. And so something like this can be very, very helpful. You know, if you're looking at a company like Target and you want to invest in them and you see, you know, they should be a profitable business. They've been around for so long, but if you see three, five, seven years of negative earnings in a 20 year span, that might be a sign of other troubles that could not be good for you. So it's a quick way to just see, okay, is this company performing how I think they should? and finding any surprises i don't think it's something you got to spend hours and hours and hours on but it's certainly something you can can give you a a quick look and see okay are they performing as i think they should okay next move on to the next thing all right well with that we'll go ahead and wrap up our conversation on financial metrics you should know hopefully you guys found this very helpful and we love doing this and so we will continue doing it so With that, we'll go ahead and sign us off. You guys go out there, invest in a margin of safety, emphasis on the safety. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you all next week.